Fine thing, and thank you for bringing it over for us to have a look at and help yourself to a mooch around the smallest cog. I will. A Let's go. Cog. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, Jimmy here. Welcome back to another video. And uh, we're not quite in the kitchen, we're sitting outside it because the kitchen's dirty and I don't want to show you because it shows you how I live. I'm a mess. The reason why I wrap again so early today is because I have a long ass drive ahead of me all the way to Herefordshire, I think it's called that. Uh, because I've been invited over to a workshop you guys might have heard of called The Smallest Cog. If you don't know The Smallest Cog, it's the workshop that has been opened and is now run by Richard Hammond. And they're doing this new series where they're asking filthy degenerate YouTubers such as this guy to come and bring their cars to be kind of, I guess, judged um, by the, the fellas at the workshop. And then have a little bit of a chat with Richard himself. So I thought it would be a uh, awesome idea to volunteer myself and go along. Now I think the idea is that the YouTubers, us, plural, um, bring you know, then a, a nice car along. But you know me, I like doing things slightly differently. So instead of taking the Skyline or the Yaris or the, you know, they're really, the, the now really quite nice Time Attack Mazda, the red one, I thought I would take the Scuffed Supra along and try and get the lowest score possible in their uh, scoring system thing. But I'm not really sure what that is yet. I need to find that out. I think it's like rated on different parts of the car, like bodywork, which is already a zero for me. So we're off to a good start. It is also though, just under a four hour drive in the scuffed Supra, which is the furthest it's driven. It's just started to rain as well. And I'm fairly sure the Supra is on some pretty aggressive tires. So I might just not make it a full stop. <laughs> To be fair, if I put this car into a ditch, it'll probably be an improvement. So, um, anyway, I'm gonna get dressed because I'm gonna be late uh, and off to the smallest cog we go. Oop. Oop. Good morning, neighbours. So, it seems I found a new feature with the car. If I turn the lights on, I do 60 mile an hour, which is, you know, incredibly normal. So I've arrived. I am here at the smallest cog, uh, Richard Hammond's workshop. Super made it. Uh, no issues at all, actually. Did really well. Um, I am always reminded how slow this thing is, but it was a nice journey. Um, a little bit sketch though. It did rain pretty intensely and I am on some sort of quite aggressive tyres, so a little bit of sailing, but it's a boat, so it's fine. And I was immediately greeted by this pretty little guy. Look at that. So cool. Let's go have a little look around. brought the car and popped it on the ramp for its inspection. Again, rooting for the lowest score possible. Um, we have Mike here from Drive Tribe, you know Mike already. Uh, Mike, tell us what's going on today. Basically, we're gonna give your car a cog score. So we're gonna get it up on the ramp and there's five categories, bodywork, mechanicals, sound, coolness, and interior. And you'll get a score at the end of it out of 50. Uh, you're our second person to do this. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. I love this car. Yeah. I love how scabby it is, <laughs> but that's just going to play into the whole thing. I think it's going to be good. Well, I think we might have corners down, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds pretty good. Yeah. Everything else, not so much. So. Well, you have just leaked slightly on the floor. So that's immediately, I think your mechanicals, your score from mechanicals might take a slight hit up. It's just leaking extra power. I don't want to be intimidating anyone. So no, I thought I'd leak a bit of power before I came on. Anthony, Mark IV Supra, where did you start on so right now, um, I'm having the Supra absolutely grilled. <laughs> um, so I'm trying not to listen too carefully because my heart, you know, but to be honest, I knew I was going to get talked down a fair bit. So I'm interested to hear what they say. Obviously, I, I can't actually hear them that well right now. I can just hear the odd scathing comment. But um, yeah, it's going to be uh, not, not, not a great score, I think. It's also interesting being on the other side. Usually, you know, I, I guess I'm the one behind the camera, I suppose, as I am now, but it's interesting seeing all the production. They have so much better production than me. <laughs> I need to up my game. 
How's it going, Mike? Going all right? Uh, yeah, good. I mean, I've owned similar cars to this. I mean, they're what, 30 ish years old. They're just naturally corroded all over. <laughs> Um, so honestly, a day with a wire brush would clean up so much of it. And Anthony was saying, you know, give them three days on the bodywork and it would be great, you know. Um, so yeah, solid car and actually perfect as a project because there's not far too much, there's no holes, there's not too much to do, but there's still enough for content and, you know, having a go. It was so, yeah. really kind of drive tribe to volunteer to pay for that as well, so thank you guys. <laughs> So you guys can make it look nice, yeah? Absolutely. How, how much like in camera can you do to get rid of all the scratches and whatnot? Um, I, uh, there's not a setting for that, I'm <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> right, so this is a bit of a surreal thing for me to do, but uh, we are currently at the smallest cog, and one of the guys, of course, behind that is Mr. Richard Hammond. Hello. Yes, it is my thing. It's not surreal. What's surreal about this? It's all perfectly normal. This is a surreal industrial estate is what it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> so for those who maybe don't know what the smallest cog is, I'm a little um, brief sort the of... The smallest cog is the idiotic realisation of a childhood dream of mine. <laughs> um, my granddad was a, a coach builder. He worked oh really? Williams. I didn't know that actually. Um, so that's kind of where the start of cars for me is. And he could do anything and everything. He could work wood, metal, leather, whatever. Mm. It's because of his background. Um, and I've always envied that and wanted some of that. I've worked with cars all my life, but I spent my whole life taking, taking the mickey out of other people's cars. Really, that's <laughs> what I did. Um, whereas I wanted to put my money where my mouth was and do something proper. And so we did, and then we thought, hang on, that might make a TV show. But the business, this is real. This is a, an enterprise. It has to make money. It is. You, you keep telling me it's real all the time. It makes something like it isn't real. Some sort of like elaborate scheme somewhere. <laughs> no, in other words, it's not a for TV thing because we're doing a TV show about yeah. it. But it, it has to be because um, otherwise there's been no point doing it. It's not, it's not just, you know. Well, I had a poke around in there a minute ago. Some really cool cars in there. But obviously the coolest car here right now Clearly, is, I mean, uh, we were, we were, is this To Supra. be fair, when you arrived with this, Jimmy, the, so HMS Engineering, that's a bunch of smelly old engineers over there. They won't mind me saying that because they are. Um, they all came out to look at this scabby shed. <laughs> no offence, man. You've got some beautiful cars and they're fine, pristine examples. No, I agree. This is a bit of a shed. And then you decided to go. <laughs> Some of my worst foot forward, you know. <laughs> it's a great car. If you look at it like that, just 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 blur your eyes a little bit, or maybe some sort of misted glasses. It's beautiful. It's not the best example of a fine car. It might be at some point. Maybe. Who yeah. knows? Well, if if you want to part with several times what it's worth, we'll finish it for you. <laughs> It's not a problem. Right, guys, the GoFundMe going up right now. <laughs> we'll sort that out. Mike, can you get some, uh, get some soapy suds? I think I'm actually stuck here now. <laughs> the board is so rough that you've tacked onto <laughs> it. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, you and Anthony have taken a look at the car now. Yep. What would you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I, I respect it. You know, it's, it's, you've also got it for fairly cheap. <laughs> and you know you're treating it as a project you know what we've done is we've actually bought too nice a project car for our channel mm. so we actually can't create much content but you with this could just go nuts almost every part of it needs some attention so you can just do video after video absolutely shed i mean we have to now this, this thing goes out on track fairly often well we'll do anyway so we we'll have to get you out on it and you can experience what it's like yeah, to sail a, a, a land yacht <laughs> absolutely well hard to say I mean, but my my aim is to also have a track car at some point so yeah it'll be cool to have a look V10 MX-5 versus Supra. I mean, we're like two years into the V10 build, so give me until like 2025 and it'll actually be finished. But yes, <laughs> technically. Yeah, so 220 horsepower, right? Roughly? Ish. Yeah, pretty much exactly the same. Um, it, it, weigh, it weighs a similar amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be fun, that could be fun. Um, but yeah, also with all your other cars, like we should definitely do more content, drag races, track days, a lot. So, yeah. What do you reckon, guys? Skyline versus M5 at some point? That would be good. Any versus massive turbo. That could be fun. Easy peasy. <laughs> Jimmy. Hello, hello. You're right, nice to see you. Good to be here. Which is like a formal handshake. Yeah, there you go, that's nice. Nice to see you. <laughs> Welcome to our humble abode. Welcome to Drive Tribe, nestled here at the smallest car. Um, it's really nice to see you, and I'm really glad you've come along. But at the same time, I don't want to be rude. I'm kind of not. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a great friend of Drive Tribe. I know you're a familiar face. But... Jimmy, try to work out how to say this. I, I don't understand you and your entire life. 
Well, I do, because if you think, if you think about it, your story is, um, I'm what, 20 years older than you, that's all. But in those 20 years, the entire world has changed. So you started sim games, that's what that... Yeah, so basically I started on a, a simulator when I was, how old was I? I was, I was about 20 when I started um, just doing sim racing. Like, just bought myself a little wheel, a little pedal set, and just went from there. And I actually worked as an insurance salesman at the time, so it was like my entire salary went, oh on, my God. went on that. So um, working as an insurance salesman? Yeah, yeah. I'm just pretty boring. It was pretty soul destroying. Right. Uh, and is his parents' house you're going home to? Your yeah. Home? So I, I lived at home at the time because yeah. I sort of I was between just just before I went off to university. So I thought I'll do it here. And, and also, do I do understand it's not entirely cheap to establish yourself living in your own house these days. No, like, it really isn't. Ruinous. No, it's impossible. Yeah, I'm in debt for life now. But yeah, that's, that's uh, <laughs> so you'd go home to your parents' house, mm. and then so um, and basically just. I thought, oh, you know what? Um, this is really interesting to me, driving this fake car on this fake circuit. My friends are going to want to see that, and I'm sure everyone's going to be very interested in it. So I made a video about it, popped it on YouTube, and no one watched it because obviously, who the hell is this guy making videos about fake race cars doing fake things? Fast forward a few years, I've been doing it for a while, and I started to learn how to do commentary at the same time because no one likes watching a car going around. Well, actually, I do, but I'm a bit. Bit weird like that but no one was watching a car go around with no one talking about it no one engaging in so i try to do stuff like that and it just sort of built and built and built and then you get sufficient people interested in this so it goes beyond your mates your mates saying hey no there's mm. jimmy he's doing well like watching him play a computer game they didn't watch anyway to be honest oh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, mate, you, mate, your mates never do <laughs> no none of my mates watch anything i do just as well um and then eventually that became a living yeah, so um, this is when I sort of found myself in the shed. Um, this is when I came back from uni, and so there's stuff to go over there. But in, in this sort of conversation here, I, I started to realise that the money that I was making from sort of ad revenue and stuff like that was starting to become that of like a part-time job. And I was like, okay, cool, this is actually something to do. And then that just sort of builds and builds and builds to the point where, okay, this is now earning me more than I used to earn when I worked as an insurance salesman, which to be honest isn't that hard anyway. But um, it was... Yeah, that moment was a real realisation that, hey, there's a career in this. If I sort of play my cards right and keep it going, um, the, the job for me, it became a, a sort of full time. I couldn't do anything else. And it was very hard to explain to my mother what I was doing. She's like, well, I just hear you shouting down there. It's like, not proper, like it, are you all right? It like, is not a proper job. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that a lot. Like what you do is, is not, no. it's not a real job. So this is in this is the shed stage. We're now into the shed. Yeah, area. yeah, we're there now. So. Okay, there it is. <laughs> now it gets big, and now you eventually grow to like three hundred thousand plus followers. That's a lot. That I saw a video of us talking to you before on Drive Travel. So at that point, that's like a weighty enterprise by then. Yeah, that was um, when Mike came down to look at the the skyline. Actually, so mm -hmm. I, I, I love that video because um, one, it, it did unexpectedly well. I didn't would think people would be interested in hearing sort of the story, and two, it's nice to show off the car. And I was like showing off the cars, you know. Um, but that was um, that was a bit of a turning point that video because it came not long before um, sort of COVID happened. Yeah, but like well, absolutely. And well, you're sort of now enormous. Well, never think of myself like that really. Um, but, but some of the people here recognise you. So the people from HMS Engineering, my neighbour, mm. they came running out to see you and to see the car. And it's like, what? Oh, there's a whole universe going on. And this is where I, why mm. I say, Jimmy, I don't understand <laughs> like your, your life so you managed to turn hobby into job well done you good and it then steps back into like the analog real world that i move around in mm. uh, in two ways number one you turned it into you're actually racing for real now uh, not for real i, I don't know should i say for real no i, I, I say that what, what Do you? The, the term that um i've heard is full metal racing Compared to virtual racing, I think I might be a bit sick. <laughs> it's fine, right? Yeah. Is that what they say? The form, or, I said that's, that's, oh, you're going full metal racing. That's just oh no, that's grubby <laughs> and oily and horrid. Really? Well, that's what that's what Heine says. Right. Uh, you're not saying that, are you? No, I said real racing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what you do is real because well, put it this way: you are competing for real, and you're earning a living from it. That's pretty damn real. Um, so there's a moment in your life I'm really interested in, which is uh, you've turned your sim racing into a career. You built it's a business. I mean, it's, it's, mm. it's a career. You've built that out of it. You get the offer to go and drive in the analog world, all of which means it's leading to a moment when, for the first time, you're buckled into a race car and uh, you're not in your shed anymore. And when you hit the loud one, it and you are gonna move very rapidly in that direction. How did that feel? 
I remember this like really well. It's one of those flashbulb memories because obviously it's uh, that was a dream to be sitting there, to have all these people buzzing around you and strapping you when you think, oh, bloody hell, this is actually going to happen, isn't it? Like, I've got to go out there and do it now. I thought this was just... I thought it would just happen. Um, and I remember hitting the button at the start and the car coming alive and like this, the, the, the fire and the vibration through as it started like breathing its sort of first breaths. And thinking to myself, well, I've got to go out there and I've got to put the throttle all the way to the floor. If I don't do that, I'm never going to be able to survive this. So it was at, um, at Anglesey. Uh, Anglesey doesn't really have a straight, it's more of just a weird curve on the back of it. And I went out the back of it and went right, floor it. And I remember thinking, well, I can't really say what I was thinking. It was more, oh dear, oh my, oh no. <laughs> um, and then at the end of it, I was like, oh, okay. I know now what that feels like. So you were like just an ordinary driver in, the, in terms of the analog world. Yeah, I mean, at the time as well, it was sort of before I, um, before I lost a, a bit of weight to get in the car as well. So here comes a sort of like quite round gamer getting into a race car. And all these Finn racing drivers being like, do this, do that, be careful of that, do that. Well, you see, you do raise a rather good point there, because the world of sitting in race cars in the analog world versus in front of your fancy gaming machine, it's a bit more physical. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, one of the main things for me, of course, is, is neck, because these drivers can, they can pull up um, around 3G in some corners. You'll feel that. And when you have no neck training, I mean, you've, you've driven some pretty... Fast stuff. Yeah, usually upside down. It doesn't count. It's different. <laughs> well, when you were staying on your tires, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, your neck gives up fairly quickly. Um, for me, it was I drove Silverstone. It was our first circuit we raced at, and I remember going through the the veil corner, the one on the just before you come onto the last straight. And at the end of the race, my legs went pop onto the headrest. I couldn't keep it up anymore. And there's a big mark on my 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 lid where it's been scuffed, where I couldn't keep my head up anymore. I'm guessing. Has it changed the way when you're playing Sims, when, you're, when you step into the, if, if you're going to inspect a track mm. through a simulator, does it, has it changed how that feels? Because you know, I'm going to be driving this for real. Yeah, I think so. Like you, I look out more for things like curbs. If, if, if I'm in a simulated version, because in, in Sim, you can just clatter over the curbs and the car's like, yeah, it's fine. You do that in any, any race car, eventually something's going to pop off or break. So you sort of be a bit more careful with it. Also, I'll, I'll tend to go around, you can go around like in a free camera, like you're almost walking around the circuit, but of course like virtually. And I look for things like camber, because camber is so important when you're racing to sort of dip a wheel into it, to hook you around a corner. On like a 2D monitor, you won't actually see the camber very well. So it's, you sort of have a different way of inspecting it after you sort of know what to look for in the real world, if that makes sense. I followed some of it. I mean, I was kind of there with you for quite a bit, but one thing that came out of it, does that mean, hold on, is your experience on track now informing your experience in sim? Are you able to see things? Do they carry things like camber that you can't really read on a 2D screen into the game? Yeah, it's, it's all there, but you have to sort of know it's there. So has it made you a better sim racer? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say it has. Um, but, well, two reasons really. One, what I said there, the camber, because uh, Alton Park is a great example. Every corner like this, mm. but you don't know it is until you actually go and walk around it. Um, and then also being a bit more like decisive in what you're doing, because in real racing, if you sort of hover around somebody, they're not going to see you. You're going to have a crash. It's all horrible. People hate, hate you. Do that in sim racing as well. If you just lunge people and let people know you're there, they're going to get out of your way. That's what you've got to do. Be more aggressive and just put the car in places. So both types of racing are informing each other. Each one helps the other one. Yeah, I think they go hand in hand now. I'm sort of getting there, mate. It's still like a halt. <laughs> Have you tried any sim racing before? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> we don't need to talk about it. No? Fine. So the other thing I don't understand about your life, because I mean it when I don't understand, I don't know how you be Jimmy Broadbent, because I don't get your whole it's world. Constant pain. <laughs> um, is the actual cars, because you have now started collecting. Mm. And you like a Japanese car, don't you? Yeah, so like a lot of people from my, I guess, generation, just grew up with Gran Turismo and sort of Gran Turismo 1, GE2. I played the you know, absolute hell out of those games. And um, I sort of fell in love with all those 90s JGM icons, you know. So um, but one of the cars, of course, here today, the, uh, the Supra, which is... Well, that's, uh, see, that's what startled me. You rocked up in it. Uh, not want to be rude about another man's car, but my God, it's a shed, isn't it? It is a shed. <laughs> um, you rolled up in that. And it's a familiar car to me. I remember them. I remember them when they were new. I remember driving them, testing them. I think I made a film on them on, on Men and Motors in the old days. Probably I will have done. Um, 
They were nice, but they didn't stir me. Mm. And yet, as you pulled up in that, all the lads from HMS Engineering next door, who never <laughs> come out to look at anything, and we rock up here with all, as you can imagine, all sorts of cars, not bothered. That, they were all, when you saw them, they came chatting to you, they're all lined up. Oh, mm. they're desperate to see it. So it obviously stirs something. I'm, tr I'm trying to analyse what that is, because it provoked the same reaction in them, and I, I, I suspect in you, as would for me, an 80s 9-11. Mm. Yeah. Somebody came in in the mid eighties, nine eleven turbo. I'd be like, Ooh! and you get up. I want to touch oh, it. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. But it, because I don't have that connection with that car, it doesn't do that for me. And I want it to. How do I make it do that? What What am I missing? Um, I think I go back to being maybe like fourteen, fifteen years old and watch Fast and Furious and stuff like that. And those films are like absolute cack. They're awful. But the cars in them. That's why people watch it. Wow, look at that car. Look at it tuned. You know. And I think nowadays, you know, like, like old Porsches and whatnot, if you, if you roll up in that, the person knows automatically you're an enthusiast and they want to talk to you. They want to talk about nerd things with you, you know. And, you know, when they have Mike saying, oh, what, what is the official designation? Like, oh, actually, it's an SZ. And, you know, yeah, well, that's just Mike. I and mean, we don't, you know, <laughs> he doesn't, not a lot of people will talk to him, to be honest. He's always on his own in bars. I not at first, but fairly shortly afterwards, yeah. I haven't noticed that sort of, uh, sort of tide of people getting away but yeah I mean it's one of those cars I think that I think iconic is it sounds a little bit too over the top um, but everyone knows what super is when you see it I walked away from it to come back in here and chat to you and I have to say for the first time I looked at it differently honestly with my older eyes I'd have just seen it's just an old Toyota but, um, this time, my first car was a Toyota Oh, really? Which one was it? Corolla Liftback. Oh, yeah, fancy. Yeah. There's one of the Blues Brothers. Yeah. It's brown. <laughs> Mine was red. <laughs> um, but I think I sort of got it. There is that... I think sometimes with a car like that, it does. it's not even exclusively about the engineering and the performance. It is inevitably about the connection and about mm. when it really moved your world, when it was a thing of such incomparable expense and aspiration and oh that's the thing when it had that yeah, status yeah. for you it does fire that up again because if you put that next to you know the 911 I'd want from the 80s which would be better uh, arguably the Toyota would probably I don't know Not um, that one. <laughs> you could, we'll get to that um, so it isn't a definitive thing it's not like which is empirically the better mm. it's which one chimes with your soul isn't it yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, if you like terrible interior and plastic and, mm. you know, cars that mm. they call, old Japanese cars are pretty much where, you, you, where you want to be. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, the rule I sort of say to myself is, do you look back at it in a car park? And like, with that, every time I'm like, yeah. there it is. Like, How do you feel when you walk back and you paid for your fuel and you're walking back to it? Because well, uh, nine times out of ten, someone's like, this is yours. And they want to talk to you about yeah. it. Um, either that or embarrassment because of how it looks. But, um. Well, you see, that's what that, but let's come round to your your car today. Um, you've been collecting some. I mean, you've got some proper. Just skip through. Don't list them all because you know, um, it's just annoying. I had to sell all I mean, to buy this. Oh yeah, I thought that was yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> uh, so you've you've. I mean, you're the the highlights of your. So it'll be the R thirty two GTR, the Skyline. Yeah. Um, love that thing. That's a hero car. Um, there's a GC8 Impreza because I love an Impreza. Yeah, that's I've, the law. Yeah, in a job in me. I need no, to you actually have to. It is legally your band to. <laughs> um, two MX-5s. One is on bodies, NA. It makes about 180 horsepower, which is really nice. Sounds cool. Yeah. The other is a Time Attack Beast, which has an SR20 and makes about 600 horsepower. Stupid. Um, Silly car. What else is there? DR Yaris. So look, the thing so, about all of these <laughs> are, they are all, they're all... Fine and pristine examples. They're, I mean, they are proper. They're, they're showstoppers. Yeah, mostly. So why did you buy a shit one? <laughs> well, two reasons. One, because I'm tight, and a pristine, nice one is about 40 grand. God, is it, man? Yeah, for, for a twin turbo Super. Supra, for a nice one. I remember the twin turbo Supra when it was... I'm sure I test drove it on Meta Motors. We'll have to have a look. I'm pretty confident I did. Oh, my God. I mean, and this is not a nice one. It isn't, is it? It's um, what I like to call used. Um, ruined. Ruined, out, yeah. Exhausted. Flogged. <laughs> it's a dead horse. So what will be the next big thing then in terms of 
the collectability, the desirability of those, what's the next wave of those cars going to be, do you think? I mean, you know, given that mm. you're still, you know, very much connected to and part of the sim racing world, and that's where young people tend to be, <laughs> who will define what the future is, what, 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 what's going to be the next thing that I don't understand? Well, you know, I, I think that, well, if I, if I had to predict something new to come out, I'd think it'd be more people coming over from, from sim mm. and getting into to real life. And I think, like, we've seen it a little bit in some GT racing where they have sim racing series that the drivers have to take part in and it actually uh, contributes to championship points. Um, so that's, um, that's really cool. I love seeing that happen. And the pro drivers don't like it so much, but they'll get over it. Um, I think that'll be it. We see more of that mixing together. You know, we've seen with sort of Formula One, they really engaged in the F1 esports over the course of lockdown, stuff like that. Seeing all the F1 drivers get involved and take that seriously was really nice. Um, because when they do take it seriously, it becomes, it, if you take away the, the fact they're in a game, they're still prepping the same way they would in an F1 race, maybe with a little bit less physical training. But It's just that blurring the boundaries, isn't it? And mm. his question, which way round works better? Is a sim racer comparably better when they get into like an analog racer? Or is an analog racer better when they get into a sim racer? Which one, which way does it work best? I think it's harder to go from being a racing driver to topping into a sim because you're having stuff taken away. Mm. Like you're losing things like G-force and just the feel of the car and whatever the car's telling you mechanically doesn't exist. So when you're a sim racer, you're having information added. So you go, oh, that's what that is. Okay, yeah, you know. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. Because that must have been a real bowel troubler for you the first time you realised, this is real G-Force and I can feel this. Yeah, like, oh, I could, I could, I could crash here. I could actually you know, die. Yeah. You, 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 like a little thing, I was going down the straight of snatches and thinking, I should probably brake at some point like I, to stop the car so you know I don't go spearing off. Because mm. I'm actually in it. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's a sort of bit of flesh in here that needs to survive. But interesting, I hadn't thought of it that way, that yes, but I can see it. Of course you are. When you are going into sim from analog, you are shedding signals, mm. feedback, information that you get. But going the way you've gone, all of a sudden, ooh, I've got all this extra stuff. I can feel lateral grip. I can feel all this happening. It's, it's a new experience because you don't really know what that feeling is. It's like sort of gaining a sense for the first time. And what is that? But you are doing quite well. Um, I think I've been steadily improving since I started. Um, Bloody hell, I set you up with it. Um, you're doing quite well. You could give it the, oh, I'm kind of a big noise. But you are. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going well enough. You know, hmm. I think that in my own performance, there's still time there. Um, so I'm partnered with a pro driver. Uh, named, his name's Gordy Much, and he's just his absolute, um, he's a massive talent, basically. And I'm comparing myself to him, which is a bad idea, because he's been doing it since he was, you know, old enough to, well, to talk. So... Um, so I'm about se second and a half, two seconds lap slower than him at the moment, which is not bad because it places me as one of the quickest amateurs, which is nice. And a lot of the amateurs have been driving for you know, 10, 20 years and other things. So um, to sort of come in at that level is really good. I think there's still time there, but it's learning downforce has been the, the tricky thing for me because it's just going into a corner and going, okay, if I don't break, your brain's saying, um, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. It's just terrific, isn't it? And then you come off on that corner and then you're told, well, you've got to go quicker. Yeah. No. You spun because you were slow. Yeah, like, no, it oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> Hold on a minute, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's, you have to really persuade yourself. Um, but eventually got there as well, you know, and uh, it's amazing what downforce can do in a car once you sort of learn it. But um, yeah, I mean, we've had um, three wins so far over the course of sort of our partnership together. So that's been really nice. And I think that we have a, good chance of taking the championship if we have a good run to the end of the season from now um, but I think I'm only ever going to get better so that's sort of what I'm focusing on now is just improving more. So have you now got two careers sim racing? racing? I, I think so I mean the racing doesn't quite pay for itself yet as you as you know it's very expensive to go racing. It is quite costly. Um, might as well just sell the house to be honest. Throw and, the money in the canal. Yeah hmm. <laughs> but um, I've been trying to use one to sort of fun the other and the idea is eventually I'll sort of both work together and I can do both and try and make a career out of doing both because it would have been easy to sort of stay on YouTube and stay doing sim stuff but that's whilst I love that stuff it's not what my passion is my passion is actually getting in the real cars and you know smelling the brakes and feeling the G's and all that stuff so um, this is I mean sort of a transitional period at the moment and yeah because I can see work. nobody really likes 
earning a lot of money from staying at home doing something they love that's perfectly safe. You're far better off <laughs> doing something that costs you money to do and can kill you. It's a, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that, you put it that way, there. I mean, there is some, some brain troubles there. Yeah. <laughs> but, Jimmy, thanks so much for coming to see us today. Uh, I know the chaps would have been looking at your car. They'd be kind. <laughs> this is disintegrated on the ramp. Um, and I will watch out for you in the future. And I kind of understand a bit more now, but honestly, it's two whole different worlds. But we're in the same world. I'm so. glad I could, I could educate you, you know. I'm here to teach. Me, <laughs> me. You might need to write some of it now. <laughs> but pleasure to see you today. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. But that's um, pretty much uh, my day done here at the Smallest Cog. Um, what an amazing day, uh, getting to meet Richard Hammond and talking about the car and having a chat with him. That's a really mad experience. I mean, similar thing with James May, you know, I've been watch watching those guys as a teenager and uh, grew up with their their content. So to get to meet, uh, meet him was, was pretty damn awesome. Also great to see Mike again and just talk about cars for a bit, really. It's uh, always a really cool any excuse to get this absolute weapon out and yeah if you want to find out how this thing scored after uh, a thorough inspection by mike and anthony you can check it out over on the drive tribe channel link below in the description and again just a massive thank you to mike and richard for inviting me over and uh, let me come up and say hello um I, I can't tell you how friendly everyone was especially when you know i'm a bit of a nervous wreck coming to these things most of the time so uh yeah awesome to see him and i hope you guys enjoyed the uh, experience too feel free to tap that like button subscribe do all the youtuber things and uh, i'll see you for the next one take care have an awesome day see you next time